you're listening to the Down East Mike Podcast, the quirky little podcast from me. And now, your host, Down East Mike. Dee 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 Good morning, everybody. This is Down East Mike. And you found the Down East Mike podcast definitely moving at a different pace here. We're not all like amped up like those people on the big networks who are always like pumped up and brr, 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 get going, get get out there, get anxious about it. We're the opposite. We're real laid back here on the Down East Mike podcast and we just let the stuff just roll over us like water off a duck's back. And today is, uh, we'll look at the calendar, February 17th, 2023. This is Down East Mike episode number 78, news and commentary for Friday, the 17th of 2023. And our motto, in case you're just, you're new to the podcast, our motto is, some of this is whimsy, some of it's true, and the interpretation of it all is entirely up to you. I hope you're having a good Friday. They're shaping up. We had like 57 degrees here in Maine yesterday. Just unheard of high temperatures for this time of year. And everything melted. The gutter fell off the front of the house because of the downspout, actually. It looked like crap out there. And I came home from work. And there's that downspout falling down across the deck. It looks like we had abandoned the property. But what had happened was the snowbank had melted and the downspout had just fallen so much so fast just like down east mike it fallen so far so fast that it fell down across the deck so i had to trudge out through the two feet of snow that was left there and put that back up the other thing i wanted to talk about in my monologue today has really been bothering me we're watching a lot of old reruns on tv because the news is so bad we're watching like mash and the original Hawaii Five-0, and they all had like really big bouffant hairdos. Nice suits, though. They look pretty sharp, those guys. And gals, the ladies look very pretty. Not a lot of tattoos like you see today. But the thing that bothers me is that it's in 4K, and it, when there's certain angles, you look at it like against the sun or whatever, and some of these guys have ear hair that's about six inches long. It is absolutely disturbing to see the the high definition old reruns. And then it makes you self conscious and then you say, Well what if, do I have ear hair that's five or six inches long? It looks like a cactus growing out of the side of my head. We're way off track there. That's the Down East Mike opening monologue. In today, uh, did you know that Down East Mike contains no mean words? We're just wholesome goodness from Down East Maine, a historical literary auditory candy store. And we asked, did you hear the bells on the door when you came in? In today's episode, Down East Mike goes off script special edition. President Carter was tripping on Bangor in 1978 on this day. Typhus was running rampant in New York in 1892. And from Popular Science Magazine 1895, we have Chuck Cheese, Mummies, and Snow Spectacles, among other things. That was just a wonderful deep dive in Popular Science Magazine 1895. We'll get to that in a minute, but first, let's look at today's headlines. If you're just rolling out of bed and you want to know what's going on in the world without looking at the TV. Senator John Fetterman's checking himself into Walter Reed Medical Center to treat severe depression. Uh, EPA is going to hold Norfolk Southern responsible for the, and the East Palestine uh, residents voice their concerns. The Ohio train derailment latest news. Fox News hosts and executives privately mocked pro-Trump election conspiracy theories after he lost. Biden's going to speak to China's Xi about the balloon incident. That would be an interesting conversation. Um, Biden health evaluation missing the mental status exam. CNN's Don Lemon says a woman's prime ends around the age of 40. I don't know if he's an authority on that. Tesla's laying off 4% of New York employees. 
And anything else? Here? No hazmat leak reported after second Norfolk Southern train derails, this time in Michigan. Those are the international headlines. The local main headlines for today, the Maine Senate confirms Wayne Douglas as Supreme Judicial Court Justice. Uh, Maine lawmaker pleads not guilty to fraud charges, says he'll resign. That's an interesting case. Apparently he was signing up to borrow money to run his legislative campaign and didn't realize he was in violation of some things there. Uh, it's not pleasant, but bed bugs are part of Maine life. A Maine man was seriously injured in a Hancock County snowmobile crash. And Maine's top court will block the Nordic Aqua Farms salmon farm infrastructure in the intertidal zone. I've seen where they're going to put that salmon farm up there in Belfast area. It's quite a big swatch of land that they're going to be setting the side for. These things are inevitable, but they... And they do end up taking place, but they take a long time to roll out. Let's go to our podcast. And our word of the day is apoplexy. It's a noun, apoplexy. Uh, synonyms of apoplexy are stroke, a sense of intense and almost uncontrollable anger, apoplexy. The medical evidence showed conclusively that the death was due to apoplexy. And I didn't know that people died of apoplexy today, but they died of it a lot back in the day. Uh, Recent examples on the web. Never felt a single symptom unless apoplexy is one of them. Currently, the top cause of death globally is heart disease. And the second is apoplexy or stroke. So that's where they're getting into a synonym there. The, it's from the Middle English apoplexy from Middle French in Late Latin, Middle French from Late Latin apoplexia, and from the Greek apoplexia, uh, apoplexine to cripple by stroke. And the first known use was in the 15th century. So I think it was in more common use, and we'll find it later in the podcast. That's why that one came up. Happy birthday today to Rosemary from Portland. She'll be 15 today, Rosemary. Rosemary hasn't missed a day of school since COVID, and she's up to date on all of her vaccines. That's wonderful. Happy birthday today to Polly of Brunswick. They turn 25 today, and they are very proud of their contributions to the new waterfront pathway being built in Brunswick. Okay, let's go back and look at this day, February 17th in 1978 from the Bangor Daily News. The land claim theme was dominating President Jimmy Carter's visit to Bangor. So exciting. And this is when it's happening. President Carter will arrive in Bangor Friday evening to campaign for Democratic Senator William Hathaway. I don't remember him. During his overnight visit, the president is expected to face strong criticism of a new White House plan for resolving Indian land claims to 12 million acres or approximately two-thirds of the land area of the state. President Carter's plane will arrive at the main Air National Guard installation at Bangor International Airport at 6.20 p.m. In the Bangor International Airport, if you've never been there, that's a great airport to watch planes fly in and out of because it's got so much access along the road and got a real long runway. It's quite exciting to watch planes land there. Well, and take off, of course. So Carter was going to Bangor on this day. Upwards of 300 White House attaches were expected for President Carter's visit. Advanced workers like Ruth Berry will tackle the what-ifs of the Carter visit. And they had 50 Bangor area volunteers assisting the White House in preparations. The radio and TV stations were carrying the town meeting live. And then we get into the actual event itself here. So we jump ahead a little bit in time because it's it's fun to look at uh, looking back to go ahead the next day and see how their prognostications came out. Uh, thousands queue up outside. We're going to have some wine and warm up, said one of the ERA demonstrators outside the Bangor Municipal Auditorium on Friday. A long trailing queue of people was strung along Dutton Street, leading to the auditorium. 
Everybody that had a ticket got in, a security man said. A good 3,000 people, including Governor James Longley, Senators William Hathaway and Edmund Muskie, attended the town meeting in Bangor to hear President Carter answer questions. I knew a guy once, he drove uh, uh, Senator Muskie uh, up to Campobello, some dedication up there, and he picked him up at the airport in the limousine, and he's, he was very, very kind man in person, I guess, but uh, had that intimidating senator's presence. Carter entered the warehouse, uh, the interior of the hall, exactly 8 p.m. to loud cheers and continued clapping. Boy, that's late at night. He was cheered again when, in his opening remarks, he said his brother Billy may come to Maine someday. Remember, remember Billy and his Billy beer? The BIA, Bangor International Airline, greeting was brisk and short. Like confetti, very light snow sprinkled a short reception line as President Jimmy Carter was welcomed to Bangor precisely on time at BIA on Friday. There was no applause, mainly because no spectators were allowed on the closely secured international runways abutting the Air National Guard installation. Blinding national news media lights zeroed in on the president who did not linger in them as he stepped from Air Force One down the stairs to the waiting dignitaries below. Governor and Mrs. James Longley were first in line, followed by Bangor Mayor Arthur Bruntis, who was impressed by the fact that he didn't need an introduction. Hello, Mr. Mayor, he said right to me, Bruntis explained later. Isn't that exciting? While almost every man and woman wore dark outer clothing, the president stood out in a stiffly pressed white trench coat. He wore no hat, and in person his hair is darker than it appears on brightly lit television screens. He appeared to be well rested, although this was his second stop in a three-stop New England tour. Hathaway and the long way swiftly entered a well-polished, older model Cadillac limousine, and it was a 20-car entourage, including a City of Bangor ambulance, city and state police, dignitaries, television cameras. They all sped from Air Force One and past gates one and two, where a hundred or so spectators got only a reflection of the motorcade's head and tail lights from inside the terminal. So exciting. Uh, Air Force One was going to spend the night in the Delta hangar, just a few hundred feet from where the plane arrived. And what else? So as a result of that visit, the Pingree Ears cry foul. A representative of the Pingree Ears I think we have a Senator Pingree now, right, or a Congresswoman. A group of major Timberland owners in the state has written to the White House telling federal officials that the heirs do not each own 50,000 acres of land in the Indian Claims area. Bradford Wellman, in a letter to Elliot Cutler, we know that name, in the Office of Management and Budget, said that a February 6 news release Naming the timberlands managed by Seven Islands Land Company as one of the 14 parcels which could be lost is erroneous. Wellman also asked the White House to publicly correct the list as damaging. Publication of this information is damaging to the 50 Pingree heirs. The White House recently announced a suggested settlement to the Indian land case, which would have had landowners owning 50,000 acres of more, or more it should be, pulling their land and selling 300,000 to 500,000 acres to the Indians. The White House said there were 14 such, such landowners in Maine, including the Pingree heirs, if they are taken as a group. And the Pingrees are one of the largest landowners privately held land in the United States, if not the world. Lots and lots of land owned by them. We had a story from uh, Britain that think, I think that needed to be shared. Every two days, says British press reports, Big John Knight dons a tracksuit and races over the rugged Cornish hills of southwest England to visit his neighbor, who is also his common-law wife and the mother of 11 of the 20 children in his extended household. After a 48-hour visit with Claire, who's 37, he jogs two miles back to his own rustic cottage, 
to be with his 33-year-old legal wife, Carol, and their children. The ninth weighed in at more than 12 pounds on Sunday. The 42-year-old former civil servant supports his stair-step brood through state welfare payments totaling $250 a week, according to reports. I'm no scrounger, Knight said. I'm gladly work if someone offered me a job I'd like, like teaching or lecturing on religious learning. His companion, Claire, who has six, I'm sorry, five children, I'm going to get that right. Claire has five children by an earlier marriage and six by night, but not six by day, get it, is expecting their 12th child in April. Claire said that since the newspaper articles began appearing, the family has been plagued by letters from angry Britons who criticize their lifestyle and their means of financial support. We have no luxuries, and the money covers the bare essentials, the big-selling tabloid quoted her as saying. Isn't that a nice little story? Just can't help but picture Big John in his tracksuit running over the Cornish hills. Uh, Here's a letter to the editor. It's titled, Before Surrender and it's from Dresden, to the editor, one has to wonder today if our most pressing priority is finding a way to get that flake out of the White House before he renegotiates the surrender at Yorktown with Great Britain. That was from Paul Papiachik, 1978. Just Over the Hill is the title of another letter to the editor. Listen well, folks. All you people who espouse words of liberalism, socialism, and communism, just support the Carter forces, and you'll get that and much more. Taxes and just plain slavery. The concepts that this power group represent will put us all in chains. Our own debt per person now is well over $150,000 due to national deficits already incurred. Who do you think will or can pay these? Of course, you and I. The present, Dem- the present Democratic administration will will you no Panama Canal, gun control, people control. Blah, blah. Get out there now and see your senators and congressmen while you still can. Oh yes, Russia is just over the hill. Things haven't changed much, have they? Little note on what the Secret Service would cost for Carter's visit. The Secret Service will spend $50,000 for President Carter's brief overnight visit. They'll have over 300 agents. They'll be staying in about 150 motel rooms, driving around town in 40 or 50 rented cars, and eating at dozens of local restaurants. The total bill for food, lodging, and local transportation should approach $50,000. Even larger sums of money will have been spent on communications, air travel, and salaries. Uh, these facts and others were, got, were garnered from conversations Thursday with Bangor business people who have been dealing with the influx of government employees. The majority of motel rooms appear to be occupied by Secret Service agents, according to sources within the motel industry. Can you just see them there smoking cigarettes and playing cards? They told me they intend to have one agent for every 10 people at the Bangor Auditorium on this day. And they go. They break down the food a little bit more. Uh, yeah, we'll move on from there. Okay. So what else uh, going on with this? At Friday night at Kalani's uh, at the Holiday Inn, Main Street in Bangor, they had a 100-pound leg of roast beef cut to order, seafood Newburg shrimp egg rolls, baked stuffed haddock, burgundy of beef. Rice pilaf. They always like to say that rice pilaf. $5.95. But wouldn't you like to see that 100-pound leg of roast beef? Where does that come from, anyway? There was a dance at the Bangor Singles Club. It uh, would have been tonight, 9 o'clock to 12.30 in the morning. Hal Wheeler. Proper dress required. All singles welcome. ID required. Wow. Uh, Clint Eastwood was out in the gauntlet. uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. There were some X-rated movies playing locally. That's awful. In Jed's Lounge, Destiny. And there was a fish fry at the Rivendale Tavern, Earl Porter, Friday night. 
And then here's a good one at the Ramada Inn in Audlin Road in Bangor. That's a homeless shelter now, I think. Proudly presents Friends, a top 40 dance group from New York appearing nightly. And you can't see the picture. I wish you could because the flare on their bell bottoms is so big it goes right off the page. And it, total Saturday night fever time. And then we found a movie playing locally that seemed like it disappeared. A Lost Fortune, Three Dark Clues, All Hidden at Candle Shoe, Where Mysterious Things Happen. And this was a Walt Disney production, Candle Shoe. It starred David Niven, Helen Hayes, and Jodie Foster. That was in 1978. Let's see, another letter to the editor. To the truly Bangor's finest. Last night I watched four of Bangor's finest apprehend and handcuff two troublemakers outside a local motel. I had been inside that night spot where the disorderly conduct began involving four young males not much older than my firstborn son. It was an eye-opener in behavior observation. As we were leaving, my curiosity and general interest made me watch while the officers did their thing. May I say you did your job very well in a commendable manner? My hat's off to you. No, had I been in your shoes, they wouldn't have been handled that gently. A letter from Charlene Bunker. A matronly scold of Orrington. All right, on this day in 1892, we have some stories to share with you. The water motor that has furnished power for the splitter in Mr. John N. Wood's wood yard on Middle Street, Lewiston. It gave out the other day, this water motor. One of the piston rods broke and smashed out 12 clogs. Mr. Wood has procured an electric motor and had it set up in the establishment. A little room has been built for it. So even then, they were going electric, getting away from that water energy. Dana Battery's first regimental gun company will give a military ball, concert, and exhibition drill on the new model Gatling gun at the Lycom Hall Thursday evening, February 18th. The new model Gatling gun will fire 1,380 shots a minute, and this company has secured 1,000 rounds of Gatling blank cartridges. It will be the first drill of the kind ever given in the state. Wilson's Orchestra is going to play from 8 to 8.30. The drill will go from 8.30 to 9, and then a grand march by 9. The music written by Wilson, apparently. And can you imagine? People would go out tonight to go see a... Gatling gun demonstration like that, the cordite in the air and the smoke and the sound, and then a wonderful orchestra. Who wouldn't want to attend that? One of the biggest oxen that ever shook a pair of ugly-looking horns was driven down Lisbon Street Tuesday night. He was a monster, a regular elephant, in fact. Mr. S. H. Morse of North J. owned him and drove him. He was five years old. This oxen weighed 2,500 pounds. He's a full-blood Durham that girded 8 feet 5 inches. A man named Mr. Powers raised him, and then he sold him to J.O. White, who in turn sold him to Mr. Morris. It's estimated that the ox would dress 1,800 pounds of beef. His mate was sold two months ago. Mr. Morris showed the beef credit to Mr. Ferd Penley, who recommended that he feed him and take him to the World's Fair to show what we can do in the way of big oxen in Maine. He would be fun to have pull your sled around the yard. One of Beers and Wilson's lumbermen arrived on the Down Express from Gorham on Tuesday night. He'd been working up on Rattle River at Camp Johnson. And uh, this guy says the deer are thick up there. They stay on the mountains most of the time. I wonder why. Spruce lumber is cut almost entirely now by the men. High up on the sides of the mountains, the trees are felled, limbed and knotted, given a push, and away they go down the steep incline. One of these logs was coming down, when coming down, will break a good-sized tree square off if it strikes right. The lumberman in question narrowly escaped being killed the other day. He and a party of other men were working on the side of the mountain halfway up. When a log comes down the mountain, the direction it's coming can plainly be heard, and if anyone is in the way, 
They have time to get out of it before it shoots past. These men heard the crashing of a log above them to the right and soon saw it coming down a short distance off. It would pass 200 feet to the right, they thought, but when it got down nearly opposite, it struck a spruce sapling just right to send it glancing toward them at terrible speed. They jumped in unison. Wonderful story. Typhus today, New York. Nine new cases of typhus fever in this city were reported, with two exceptions. The patients on Ninth Brother Island are doing well. The exceptions are two women, both of whom will die, according to the paper. Uh, in Beverly, Mass., the Boot and Shoe Workers Union has notified the shoe manufacturers here that an advance will be demanded in cutters' wages. Outside cutters receive $16 per week instead of $15, and lining and trimming cutters $13.50 instead of $12. It also demanded that 59 hours constitute a week's work, and all work between 5 and 6 o'clock Saturday be paid for extra, the new price list to go into effect February 22nd. The manufacturers say that the condition of trade will not permit of the advance. They will hold a meeting tonight to consider matters. So 59 hours was a week's work, and then you work between 5 and 6 p.m. on Saturday. Isn't that something? The false alarm of fire from Pine Street, Lewiston, Wednesday morning came about in a comical way. The kitchen girl in the family of Mr. James Harrison was burning paper in the cook stove. Some smoke had escaped into the room. The milkman saw the smoke and without waiting for an explanation said, I'll call the department. The kitchen girl thought he spoke in jest and replied in the same manner. The next thing Mrs. Harrison knew, the department and a big crowd of men were looking in at the windows. The smoke had been cleared from the kitchen before the department got there, and there was no sign of a blaze. Some of the firemen, who turned out double quick in the frosty air, would like to have three minutes at that milkman. They were mad. Mr. James Stonge and Mr. Napoleon Amnot were in Sabatis this week. When they returned, they saw a team coming over the rise by Thorn's Corner. It was an old-fashioned, comfortable sleigh, and the horse coming like the wind. As it approached, it did not turn out, and the two men saw the reins were dragging. As they turned out, they saw a man lying in the bottom of the sleigh. Whoa, said Mr. Staunch. The horse stopped after a few steps. The man was dead drunk and surely in a very dangerous position. In the cold air, he was nearly benumbed and would undoubtedly have been the victim of a bad smash-up had the horse not stopped. After shaking the drunken man awake, they braced him up in the sleigh and he went on after thanking them for the probable saving of his life. A little slice of history on this day. What else do we have for you here? Here's our story about apoplexy. Stricken with apoplexy in Portland, Maine, Daniel Murphy, aged about 24 years, a laster by trade and a wanderer, was stricken with apoplexy in the YMCA reading room on Thursday. Relatives will communicate with the Greeley Hospital in Portland. He may survive. Two more typhus cases were noted in New York. They're reported to have developed among the small contingent of Russian Hebrews who are detained at Ellis Island. They are removed to North Brothers Island. Let's get them all on North Brothers Island. All right, looking at Popular Science Magazine, May 1905. And the Jesuits, uh, oh, it's a Jessup, I'm sorry. Jessup is a North, had a North Pacific expedition from the American Museum of Natural History in 1897. Uh, means for a thorough ethnological exploration of the northern coast of North America and Asia from British Columbia to the Amur River. The expedition has resulted in valuable uh, additions to the American Hospital, and they go on, on about what it developed. Twelve volumes of work under the editorship of Franz Boas of the American Museum at Columbia University. So anyways, it goes on about them going up there, and then we get into the memoir last published is an account of the material culture of the Chukchi, the tribes inhabiting the extreme northeastern corner of Siberia, 
of special interest consequently to those who speculate on the past peopling of the Americas by way of Bering Strait, or speculating further on the future construction of telegraphs and railways through these regions. It also has the interest just now in the view of a possible change in sovereignty. It appears indeed that this territory has not been completely subdued, the Russians having withdrawn in 1764, leaving the inhabitants to settle their affairs according to their own customs. They're probably happy to do it. Commerce has in part accomplished what force failed to do, though the bulk of the territory remains exempt from any trace of Russianization. The Chukchi number only about 12,000, of whom about one quarter are maritime and three quarters are reindeer people, while there are about 1,200 Eskimo on the coast. It is not settled as to whether the Chukchi and Eskimo belong to the same stock. Types of Mongolian faces are not uncommon, and at present there is a good deal of admixture. The domestication of reindeer is characteristic of the tribes inhabiting the Asiatic side of the Bering Sea, and their economic condition resembles that of the more southerly cattle breeding tribes. The large size of some of their herds is shown in the illustration. They have a picture of a big herd of reindeer. The Chukchi depend on reindeer for clothing and for food, for the covering of their huts and for transportation. Great numbers of these animals are annually slaughtered. Mr. Bogaris having used as many as 50 in one month as food for his dogs. The price of a reindeer is a package of brick tea and a bundle of tobacco, the value of which is together about a dollar. The maritime Chukchi engage principally in fishing, and there is a good deal of exchange between them and the reindeer people. One fish, one reindeer. The houses have a wooden frame covered with skins, sometimes protected, as shown in the illustration, you have a picture of it, by sods or stone. The diameter of the hut is from 15 to 25 feet, and there is an inside room usually about four foot six inches in height, seven feet in breadth, and 12 feet in length. Talk about claustrophobic. 50 or more reindeer skins are used to cover one of the huts and they require a great deal of care. New skins are used in winter and old skins in summer. I wonder why. Fire is used for cooking but scarcely heats the house beyond the temperature of the outside air. The inner compartment is lighted by a lamp, but is heated chiefly by the bodies of the inhabitants. Oh my word. As the inner room is used not only for sleeping, but also for eating and entertaining, every square foot is occupied. The maritime Chukchi eat chiefly the meat of sea mammals, while the others depend on the reindeer. They like frozen raw meat, and they do not object to its being putrid. They drink tea and smoke tobacco continually and use as much alcohol, which may be unrectified and undiluted 95% spirit, as they can get. I bet they do. Fly agaric is the only means of intoxication discovered by the natives of northeastern Asia. It is made from mushrooms and appears to produce effects similar to hashish. The sense of smell of the natives is said to be very acute. Their color and nomenclature is defective, which may be due to defective vision or to lack of interest in colors. Hey, if you don't care about colors, you don't see them, right? Uh, what else? Oh, the mummies there. The custom of preserving... I have to be re- respective of your time here. We're getting close to time on our podcast. The mummies. The custom of preserving or mummifying the bodies of the dead as formerly practiced by the natives of the islands in Bering Sea is accounted for very ingeniously by William Hall and the American naturalists. On the mainland, either on the Asiatic or the American side, the custom does not appear ever to have existed. In the Chukchi Peninsula, on the Asiatic side, there's no soil in which to bury the dead and cremation is impossible from the want of wood. Hence, the natives expose their dead to the tender mercies of bears, dogs, and foxes. In the Yukon Valley in Alaska, the soil is hard and excavation is extremely difficult and timber abounds. And they go on to say they just basically put the bodies out there on the tundra and they become mummies. They 
break it down in quite a bit of detail. We're not going to go into that. Um, what else do we have in the podcast? We have one little more story here for you. Let's find that story. Just be one sec here. No, two more stories. A plant known in California as rattleweed is said to produce in animals which eat of it symptoms much resembling those of amentia and frenzy. A correspondent of a San Francisco newspaper writing from Monterey County describes as follows the effect produced by this plant on a herd of 50 horses on a ranch in a southern part of that county. They became, he says, crazy. They forsook the farm and wandered off one by one over the plain, paying no attention to their mates or anything else, eating rattleweed. They were too muddled in their brains to seek for water, and most of them died of thirst. Although they were wild and had never been handled, any person could walk up with them on the plain and hit them with his hand, when they would jump, perhaps straight up in the air, perhaps some other way, and act as though they were trying to leap at a fence at every step. They seemed to retain their sight, yet they would not turn aside for anything. The poor demented beast would walk over a precipice without the slightest fear or hesitation. Here's our story about snow spectacles. They've been devised for the use of the British Arctic Expedition. These spectacles have neither glass nor iron in their composition. They're made of ebonite and tied on the head by a velvet cord. They somewhat resemble two half walnut shells fastened over the eye, and the wearer sees through a simple slit in front of the pupil. To give the, eye, to give the wearer a side view, the sides of the eye box are perforated with minute holes. These spectacles are said to be of great service in reading by lamp or gaslight. Last story. Three soldiers were simultaneously struck by lightning at the Satori Barracks in Paris on May 15th. In two of them, the lightning produced complete relaxation of the muscles. I bet it did. And in the third, muscular contraction. The latter, unlike the former, retained consciousness throughout. I'm awake. I'm awake. All recovered in a few days. The metallic buttons on their clothing were not affected by the electric current. Well, let's look at the forecast and we'll send you on the way. It is going to be, right now, it's like 39 degrees and just pretty yucky out there. Uh, listen to this forecast for Friday. Rain, freezing rain, and sleet before 2 p.m. Then snow and sleet between 2 and 3. Then snow, just call it crappy, would you? Temperature falling to around 25 by 5 p.m. Northwest wind gust up to 25 miles per hour. 90% chance of precipitation today. Some new ice accumulation less than 0.1 of an inch. Um, for tonight, snow likely, but only about an inch total. And then Saturday, sunny with a high near 31. And then as it gradually warms again, Sunday's 40. And then into next week, back up into the, uh, the low 40s and 30s. So still got winter rolling on here. That's the... Uh, that's the story from Down East Maine, and this is Down East Mike. Until next time, I'm wishing that you and your loved ones enjoy a day that is full of grace, love, and kindness. We'll see you. This is a song about a girl, let's call her Alice. She lived all alone at the top of a hill in a new she met a boy named Bob and then they started dating. Things were going great till they went for a swim. Alice stripped down and jumped in. Bob did the same thing. But the cold water shrunk his bits and now he's not in the same. When she
Man. 